exposed to Auckland and Wellington and Singapore. Um, I'm also the founder of Australia Express with Motorcycles, and I'll talk about why this is relevant to a little bit later. So I had a goal with this project, well, I had a couple goals really. Um, I wanted to combine two things that I really loved doing into one package, and well, in this case that was building and riding motorcycles and going and trashing the this networks. Um, <coughs> creating a Wi-Fi review platform in the, in the process would really be a bonus for the day-to-day -day type stuff. So some real high level requirements, uh, it had to allow for a wide range of software to be run. I really didn't want to be locked down into a specific tool chain or anything like that. Um, had to be able to operate for an extended period of time, so I mean 15 minutes worth of Wi-Fi testing here is really that helpful. Had to cater for a wide range of attacks and still having VM money left over would be a real bonus. But let's talk about more driving for a little bit. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but for those of you that aren't, um, basically war driving is the process of mapping wireless networks by somebody in a new vehicle. So essentially what happens is you sit in a vehicle with a laptop and maybe a USB Wi-Fi interface or something like that. You drive around and collect information on set access points and map the set access points and then profit, maybe, I don't know. Um, the subtlety, or rather the lack of subtlety with this, with this was something that kind of bothered me. Um, it's sort of easy to spot, right? And you can't exactly park your SUV on the footpath in the middle of the CBD. That and the whole tinted windows and aerials on the roof thing was never really my style. So if you'll excuse me, I think I've come up with a solution to this problem.
tied together, um, then it's a little bit something like this. So we have the Raspberry Pi uh, running our business client talking to the network, uh, running the server, and our drones run on each of the router walls at the right. So the drones basically go and use their onboard interfaces, their slipping interfaces, and then uh, dump that data down the TCP socket, which the server picks up. For the attacking side of things, there's a set of processing scripts that live on Python, and these go and talk to the router walls that the right. Uh, the pipeline, so the main purpose of this is to run the Kismet server. Initially, I thought it would be awesome if I could build everything off one Raspberry Pi, uh, except running a Raspberry Pi with a single drone uh, gave me about two mega memory free afterwards, so that was really a good idea. Instead, opted for the network approach. Um, so the Kismet server runs on this device, USB attached GPS is used for gathering the locations of the networks that are mapped. The uh, onboard wireless is used as an access point so that one can actually go and administer, um, administer the infrastructure where it so basically pop up that pub with a laptop and go and deal with stuff. Um, this was really easy, we just hosting the and gcp 3 server. I think there was about 10 lines of config in each, so it's really easy. Uh, dedicated attack interface is also added to the white client via USB. So this is put in for running rogue access points and doing slightly more convoluted and involved attacks that you can't really automate on each of the router books. And of course it wants the Python script to go and orchestrate state automated attacks. Um, our router ones left and right, so as I mentioned, these are microchip devices installed with OpenWRT, which was a real mission in of itself. Not because running open up, out of OpenWRT is particularly difficult, simply because um, none of the documentation that's available on the internet tells you that after you TFTP boot the bastard, you have to take a cable out of port one and put it into port two before it'll start applying the pins. <laughs> so yeah, that was a waste of evening. I was not happy. Um, so the Kismet drone uh, was running on these devices that feeds the server running on Wi-Fi. Uh, dedicated attack interfaces are uh, used by USB as well. So these devices have a single USB port available, and thanks to the OWI, I think it's really easy to add support in for Atmos based uh, USB Wi-Fi interfaces. Uh, the reason I have two devices, uh, well, that actually is really simple if you haven't figured it out already. Basically, I wanted to capture both sides of the road at once while going in and driving along. Uh, the 90 bucks per device was not really that idea, uh, and the bonus of having USB attached attack interfaces is that uh, if instead of having to run a really long antenna or something like that and deal with attenuation and bits and pieces like that, instead, the interfaces can be placed basically anywhere on the bike through the use of a USB extension cable. Easy. Um, the idea behind actually having dedicated significant attack interfaces is a lot of the examples that you see on the on the net around building geolification packs and things like that basically involve using the aircraft suite and aerodome and actually locking aerodome down into a specific channel. I can't really do that because I don't have access to a keyboard uh, and no one can around these different things on a specific channel just seems like a stupid idea. So how this works is the dedicated sniffing interface just doesn't get touched. So it'll pick up whatever it sees, and the scripts can go and set the additional interface onto whatever channel it needs to be set on, and then go and orchestrate whatever crazy attack it needs. So the white pie, this one this was a little bit of fun. Um, it's a Raspberry Pi, and it's actually power of the network. The AFM needs to be power sources. Um, it's a real simple optional tool that I think it took about 20 minutes to get it running. This one's the Kismet client with a tweet layout and um, some gusset video glasses attached by RCA output for the heads up display. I know really it's just a screen that lives in the tablet, but still. I tried to go and get a photo a little bit closer. You can sort of see Kismet running in that photo um, to the right. I tried to go and get a camera in there to get a, to get a really decent photo of what the output looks like, but sadly the macro setting was not happy with the focusing lenses and things like that. So instead, I just grabbed a snapshot out of the so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, this is what I see in the um, We've got some basic data on the right hand side, so the amount of time that's been elapsed, the networks that have been seen, packets, etc., etc., etc. A list of access points. Um, these are taken with the latest access point seen coming up to the top. The GPS information is coming in. It's really, really distracting because it actually gives you an accurate speed layout, um, speed readout, sorry, um, and some info logging. So the great thing about the info logging is that all those logs have nothing to do with the client at all. They're all coming from the Kismet server. So if one of my router calls decides to explode, um, I'll get a big highlighted error message that says, hey, you should probably pull over and go and fix your shit. 
Um, the most useful part of this though, when everything is running correctly, is that the packet graph, the packet and data graph, um, gives you a really good indication of when you're going through an area or a highly populated area that has a lot of access points. The reason this is useful is it kind of gives you an indication that, hey, there's a lot of stuff around here, so maybe circling the block more times is a good idea. Um, the mounting within the helmet is real simple, so it's just basically stuck to the top of the helmet, um, which means that if you're looking through the helmet, the screens end up just about here, above one's eye um, A problem that I faced with this build specifically was that I got into the mountain and everything was working, I was looking up at the screens and everything was really blurry and just terrible. So I went through trying to you know, check the Raspberry Pi, check the uh, check RCA games, all that sort of stuff to figure out what was happening. Turns out, if you wear glasses, you're screwed. You have to put confidence in. <laughs> now, power and This is where it all got a little bit. It was kind of complicated, but then it got really, really simple. Um, a standard board driving setup usually revolves around using the cigarette lighter in your car, uh, and using that to go on power and an inverter and attaching all your various power supplies and laptops and stuff like that to set inverter. This seems like a like a little bit of a problem we can set up to me because it was basically getting DC power driven to get the AC and then back to DC. So, screw it. I figured that I got a DC to DC converter with a custom harness to go and actually power the devices would be a way easier way of going about it. There was a small problem with this though. Um, and the problem here was that the DC to DC converter that would take the input voltage range of, say, from 11 volts to 15 or 16 volts that the bike will experience while not being off, well, sorry, being off or while charging, uh, that would have set you back about 190 bucks. And 190 bucks is a low white out, so I really wasn't happy with part of that much money. Then we came to take the rest. So this DC to DC converter was 9 bucks, which I was quite happy about. Um, what this does, or what it's designed to do rather, is you, on one end, you have your secret light supply. And on the device, there's a set of switches that you can use to go and select what voltage you want to come out. And at the other end, you plug in whatever adapter you need for your specific laptop. And hey, first of all, you've got laptop power for your car. This runs basically exactly like the other DC to DC converter. It goes and takes a wide input range of voltages and spits out whatever you set it to. Um, and the 80 watt total power was more than enough to actually go and make everything work. So I was quite happy about that. Put it all together um, and set up on my coffee table, it actually ran quite well. I'm not sure if you can see that multimeter right now, um, but it was basically 12.5 volts coming off the battery that I ripped out of the XS650, um, going and powering all the devices, so the, uh, the laptop, the Raspberry Pi, and the associated devices. Um, you don't need practical wood coffee to actually go and make this work. So, mounting. Um, mounting this was actually really simple. So basically what I've got here is just two Oxford saddlebags, um, which I stole off my brother. I love that guy. Um, so yeah, there's just two, two Oxford saddlebags. So basic brackets that you put inside to make sure the shape doesn't flat, um, flat around and move too much. Uh, one side we have a router board, so that's the right side. And on this side we have the associated we have the network, the router board, Raspberry Pi, and all the associated electronics. I could have gone and hit in the wiring that's running through this a little bit better, but I don't know, I'm kind of a fan of side right? So I think I'd get a neat look. Um, all the wiring is actually going to bullet cases, so what this means is that the fly links that go to the battery can be disconnected and wired back into uh, a normal cigarette lighter plug, so you can use the thing in a cage. Apparently it's unreasonable of you to expect all my co-workers to ride motorcycles. So this actually ended up working out. Um, this is my test lab. Um, so here, basically, you can see the, the bike in the background. Uh, I'll just go on and use this SSH to connect each of the router board devices to go and check some things that are running. So you might as well have a quick run. I'm pretty sure I'm ready to turn this on. Come on, buddy. Sweet. Can you see that? So here, let's just go 
Sun is being made into white light. Good. Great. So here we are. So we're basically connected into the network that's going to be running as our uh, access point and Kismet server. So here you can see a whole bunch of Kismet data that's going to be covering up my hard disk. Um, yeah, this is just a basic um, backtrack build. The reason for the reason for using backtrack was I didn't really want to go and spend too much time trying to get dependencies and libraries and various bits and pieces running on a custom build. And this way, if I want to pull over and go and run Meta exploit for whatever reason, um, then that's totally possible. So um, the router will actually go and fire up Kismet um, by default. So it just works simple in a script called the Kismet drone. So if you flip the switch and it just work. So I'll go ahead and start the Kismet server. Great. So that's all running in happy days. Um, Okay, maybe I did not remember to shit on. Oops, my bad. Alright, so the router must take a little, little time to power up, but thankfully this is all wired into a single code switch, so we flip the switch and we'll get up. Out 
Google Maps and things like that. Uh, GIS Kidman tosses the HTML data from Kidman and turns it into an HTML database. So if you only want to map open access points or if you only want to map access points that have a specific instance ID, then that's all really possible. Um, when you do this, it ends up looking something like this. So here's a little extract that I took from my test lab. So there we go to QCon.k now. Sadly, I don't really have too many access points to show you, um, but I think it should be done. And the channel that it runs on, 
and we go in and policy commands and send it through to uh, each of the routables. Uh, the routables are defined in the config file, and they can be as many as you'd like. So, for example, if at some point I decided to go and lose whatever little dignity I had left and bought a Harley Road King, um, I could run like eight of these, right? <laughs> and probably a one new server it would be great. <laughs> would solve the problem immediately. So what, what that means is with white is running, uh, your gear is just draining off the auxiliary battery. When the white is running, the charging circuit is going and powering both the battery dedicated to the motorcycle and the one dedicated to the gear. So you drain the battery out of power, worst case scenario, oh no, you have no more Wi-Fi gear. Auto is the other one. Sadly, so I didn't have enough time to actually go and implement any of these, but going and mapping out how many auto access points one can find around New Zealand, hence there's a lot of Linksys ones. Um, it would be quite easy to go and get the, um, the tag interface on the network to go and connect to an open access point that it finds with a direct SSID and Mac. Fingerprints to make sure it's right, reconfigure it to do whatever it needs to, and then profit. it. Maybe perhaps some automatic reader attacks. This guy is really good. So to summarize this, a uh, few simple things, namely a chunk change, a soldering iron, an understanding that power is currently supplied by voltage and some basic unit skills, almost anybody can go and create their very own Wi-Fi tag cycle and terrorize their neighbors too. They think they have private lives, they have nothing of the kind. 